Hi there, my name's Peter Coffin, and I think the 2004 film iRobot is a fantastic zombie movie about how the subjective nature and interpretation of law can create armies of unthinking attackers. Change my mind. So about a year ago, I saw this video essay about how bad iRobot is. It's called I Hate iRobot. It's by this channel called Just Right. Right being W-R-I-T-E, uh, like with a pen. And it more or less centers around how iRobot is not a faithful adaptation of Isaac Asimov's work. A large amount of the discourse I've seen in the wake of this video essay, discourse about why iRobot is bad, is about how much better the movie would have been had it been a more faithful adaptation. The most prolific writer of science fiction is Isaac Asimov. Now, usually when I write a sentence like that, I'll throw in some weasel words like one of the most prolific, mostly so that pedants can't correct me in the comments. But in this, I feel that it is just literally true. Wikipedia has five separate pages just listing Asimov's bibliography. In his own words, over a space of 40 years, I published an average of 1,000 words a day. Over the space of the second 20 years, I published an average of 1,700 words a day. Now, the problem that this guy and everybody whom he has influenced seem to have is twofold. Firstly, he seems to think that the story should primarily be about the three laws of robotics. And to some extent, it is. He said they've all been programmed with the three laws, so that means we have 1,000 robots that will not try to protect themselves if it violates a direct order from a human. And I'm betting one who will. Since the third law for self-preservation is trumped by the second law of obedience, Spooner bets that the normal robots will stand in place as he destroys them. So he starts executing them one by one. But it's undermined by this second part of the same clip that pretty much outlines the entire problem for him. But then he sees Sonny flinch way back in the background. Makes no sense because Sunny is far from danger. And then any pretense that there's a battle of ideas here is over. It's time for some action, baby. Look at this fist fight. Get him, Will. You see, not enough time is spent on the intellectual implications of the three laws, and the whole thing just turns into an action movie. In becoming a bog standard American action movie, the script has to basically kneecap anything interesting about the mystery or the science fiction. You can see this play out in him calling the movie a bog standard American action movie. Ooh, how bad. In his words, it had to be kneecapped to be that thing. The intellectual implications of the subject matter had to be destroyed in order to make a bog standard American action movie. In an interview, Jeff Vinter talks about how making the film more of a Hollywood movie meant changing the detective from the more intellectual kind of Sherlock Holmes-esque character that he had originally had in mind to more of a traditional cop. And boy, can you feel that. Del Spooner isn't just less intellectual, he is anti-intellectual. You could swap this character out with any police officer protagonist in any cop movie of the last 40 years. But why is that bad? And make no mistake, the way he says it, you're supposed to understand straight up that this is a bad thing. Why though? Like, what about that is actually bad in the context of just a movie? And in my critique, I do want you to understand that it's not inherently good either, it's just not inherently bad. And that's the implication of what he's saying in the way he's saying it. He's got the attitude of a badass hero cop that knows better than all these suits and scientists. He knows how to shoot a gun, not like those flimsy women. Did you just shoot at me with your eyes closed? Well, it worked, didn't it? Oh, shit. That's like the worst example for the thing he's saying here, too. Like, she, with her eyes closed, successfully saves the day, and then Will Smith acknowledges it at the end of the clip. But no, that's misogyny, because I don't know. Never mind that given the characters, if you took gender out of the equation entirely, it would be the same. Like on one hand, you have a cop who knows how to shoot. And on the other, you have a scientist who doesn't. But no, we got to make a point about how movies used to be much more misogynist. It's actually kind of crazy how much more casually misogynistic movies from even a decade ago are. Lawrence told me to accommodate you in any way possible. Really? Okay. So, like, flirting is just misogyny, right? Like, that's just inherently devaluing women. 
You know, are we supposed to ever fuck? Like, is that what it is? Are people just supposed to hate the idea of fucking? Oh, yeah, that's right. We do live in a world that's owned and ruled by people who think there's too many of us, us being the proles. Spooner's most unique characteristic is his rejection of all futuristic technology. He's introduced to us wearing Converse shoes, listening to old CDs, and later driving a gas-powered motorcycle in a world where everyone has an electric car. And since technology turns out to be the bad guy of this movie, all of his skepticism is rewarded. Now this is specifically why I dislike what this person is getting at. This is a work unto itself. Its context is the social consciousness and environment of 2004. Something like AI at this point was a hypothetical, and therefore we have to project our ideas as to what it would look like. And in doing so, we are projecting humanity onto it. And I think that that's just fundamentally elusive towards people who look at movies in this way. And since technology turns out to be the bad guy of this movie, Vicky, the AI, the big bad AI, the main antagonist of the film, who decides that for the overall safety of humanity, some people's lives and freedoms have to be sacrificed, is not an AI coming to that conclusion. Vicky is not an AI. Vicky is a character in a fictional story. And I don't think that's a bad thing. In fact, in the context of the fact that this has been transferred from various Isaac Asimov's works into a mainstream Hollywood blockbuster film, I actually think that's a good thing that makes the movie better. Representations of AI have to have something human about them to understand, either uh, in its total embodiment or in contrast. GLaDOS and Shodan uh, both are megalomaniacs. They reflect a personality type, ideas, motives, etc. They are sociopathic and evil. And what are those things? Human ideas. On the other hand, Skynet is envisioned as a contrast to humanity. It is relatable because it is not relatable. In a lot of ways, it's meant to echo a computer virus or something along those lines. Something that created under human supervision goes rogue and unforeseen consequences occur. It's not so much asking what is an AI, but rather prescribing AI as a counterweight to humanity. And thus, it is inextricably anchored in humanity. Within the scope of this essay, the author acknowledges that Isaac Asimov doesn't write characters with typical conceits for narrative storytelling. What I mean is that he is more of an ideas guy. His characters are not typically three-dimensional people you come to care about all that much. They're simply tools used to communicate the science behind whatever he's interested in. So there's just this giant gaping hole in his writing that a Hollywood production needs to fill somehow, or at least they feel they need to fill it. If you are making a story, especially a condensed story like a film, this shit is super important. I was just having a conversation with someone about tension in movies and about how uh, there's often an event in the film which is a relieving of all of the tension that has been set up throughout the film. Uh, your characters are key in that. Their motives and interests and actions all should build towards that climax in the context of a film. Why are characters doing this thing? Why is Vicky doing this thing? And in recent years, we've seen these conceits seriously neglected, but people asking the question, why are movies failing so bad recently? A lot of people think that it's about wokeness or about what kinds of stories are being told, but I think it's more of a problem of era. When? Now. Um, the people who are making these films grew up as hyper-consumers. Their identity and community is formed around things that they consume rather than the people around them. To spend time on Wikipedia finding out more information about Star Wars, that is development for them in terms of it, not only just identity and community, but the property in question. So instead of thinking about these things as films, they're thinking about them as consumer products. If the movie is an extra hour longer, A, that must be more valuable because there's more content, and B, if they're telling us 
everything about everything, that must be better, right? I know more now, and therefore I'm a bigger fan. And as a filmmaker from this perspective, that allows me to adapt the source material more faithfully, right? If I just take that extra time and include all these extra bits of information, that's a better movie. To make an authentic feeling story, the concern isn't how original all of the various elements of the story are. In having the character suspicious of everything that's going on in the movie, we have conflict that the audience immediately understands because the world of the movie is completely foreign to them. In 2004, iRobot looked fucking insane. It's maybe a little less insane looking in 2023. We do have AI to some extent, but it doesn't actually look a lot like that. But all the different personality quirks, what this video essayist has labeled as anti-intellectualism, uh, that all justifies why this character is more like the audience than like the world the audience is being presented. The converse, the internal combustion engine motorcycle, that stuff all makes him real. If it's a guy who lives in this world, he's super intellectual and agrees with everything going on, what's his motivation to investigate it? Why would he see that dead scientist and think, a, a robot did this? No one else in this world thinks that. Why? Because they're not like him. They just think all of this stuff operates without question. With these conceits, he makes sense. And the bad guy of this movie isn't technology, because what happens to the technology after they've won? Did they shut it all off? No. The bad guy of this movie is the subjective nature and interpretation of law and the power to enact an interpretation of law that is dangerous. So it is about ideology. This subjective interpretation of law is enforced, and like I said, it creates an unthinking army of attackers on the behalf of whom? Vicky, the owner of the means of production. Yes, legally speaking, Vicky might not be the owner, but for all intents and purposes, Vicky owns this because she has a specific relation to it, which gives her the last say, the total control over it. And I think it should be really obvious how it's a zombie movie, that unthinking army. It's just that unthinking army is used to talk about something. These zombies aren't just some supernatural disaster that happened, not a pandemic, not an unmotivated thing that just exists out of the ether, like a lot of zombie movies. They act on behalf of the ruling class. What I'm getting at here is I don't think that a movie where AI is the bad guy is really about AI. In order to figure out what the bad guy really is, we should be asking the question, what is the bad guy AI doing? And does that represent something that is happening in real life? Again, with iRobot, it is about the subjective nature and interpretation of law and about how there is somebody with the power to enact that subjective interpretation of law. And when Vicky does what Vicky does, it creates an unthinking army of attackers that works on her behalf. Does that sound familiar at all? Does that sound like something that keeps happening throughout history regardless of AI? iRobot is a zombie movie critiquing that. It may not have been intended that way, and I'm not talking the death of the author or anything. I I'm talking about the film within its historical context, its socioeconomic and cultural context. How does it relate to the world that it was created in? Also, like, it's fun. The types of people who make these kinds of essays just hate fun. They think, like, flirting is misogyny. Honestly, fuck the people who make this kind of video. They just nitpick at crap to figure out some way for them to be right about why something is bad. But the fact is, they just have what everybody else has, which is subjective taste. And it's so, so prominent because I think that it's a product of the same partisanship that has been injected literally everywhere else in our lives. 
Again, they've normalized a mode in which everything that we consume is both how we make our identity and how we form community. And therefore, in terms of identity, everything that is against what we personally like or dislike uh, feels like an attack on us. And in terms of community, you're supposed to advocate for consumption of your community. You're supposed to want to normalize it, make the fandom grow. That means there's going to be more content. And, oh, those people who don't like it, you're supposed to advocate against them. The anti-fandom, oh, they're bad news. This is the most important shit in my life because it's me and my community. And again, off in the background, the pig in the top hat is loving every minute of it. And I think that's all I got for you today. Um, like, comment, and subscribe. Maybe become a patron. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.